Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Nell Pepper, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I am delighted to introduce this virtual event with Jacqueline Winspear presenting her latest Maisie Dobbs novel, A Sunlit Weapon. I hope you're all well and safe. Thank you so much for joining us virtually tonight. Through virtual events like tonight's, Harvard Bookstore continues to bring authors and new books to our ever-expanding digital community. Every week we host events here on our Zoom account, although we are uh, beginning to have or excuse me, beginning to have in-person events as well in the store. And you can check out the event schedule on our website at harvard.com. And while you're there, you can sign up for our email newsletter for more updates and you can browse our bookshelves from home. This evening's discussion will conclude, or reading, I should say, this evening's reading will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a spoiler-free question for, <laughs> for the author at any time during the talk tonight, you can click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen, and we will get through as many questions as time allows. This event also has closed captioning available. Depending on the version of Zoom that you are using, you may need to enable captions yourself by clicking on the closed caption button on your screen. Also in the chat, I will be posting a link to purchase copies of a sunlit weapon on harvard.com. Your purchases and financial contributions make events like tonight's possible and help ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore in Cambridge, in Harvard Square. We thank you so much for continuing to show up and tune in and support us, not only for our author's sake, but also to continue to support the fantastic staff of booksellers at Harvard Bookstore. And we all sincerely appreciate your support now and always. And lastly, as you likely have experienced in virtual gatherings, technical issues may arise. We, of course, hope that they do not. But if they do, we will do our best to resolve them quickly. Thank you so much for your patience and understanding. And now it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's author. Jacqueline Winspear is the author of the New York Times bestsellers, The Consequences of Fear, The American Agent, To Die But Once, in this grave hour, as well as 12 other best-selling Maisie Dobbs novels. Her standalone novel, The Care and Management of Lies, was also a New York Times bestseller and a finalist for the Dayton Literary Peace Prize. Jacqueline has published two nonfiction books, What Would Maisie Do?, and an Edgar-nominated memoir, This Time Next Year We'll Be Laughing. Her latest novel, a Sunlit Weapon is set in October 1942. Joe Hardy, a young ferry pilot, is delivering a fighter aircraft when she realizes someone is shooting at her aircraft from the ground. When she returns to the location, she finds a Black American soldier, Private Matthias Crittenden, bound and gagged in a barn. He claims that his friend and fellow soldier, a white man named Charlie Stone, has been kidnapped. Matthias is handed over to American military police and kept in custody. Then uh, two days later, Joe's friend, another ferry pilot, crashes in the same area where Joe's plane was attacked. Joe seeks Maisie Dobbs for help. Meanwhile, Maisie's husband is preparing for the visit of First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt to Britain. Maisie discovers that there may be a connection between the death of the ferry pilot and Charlie's disappearance and Mrs. Roosevelt's visit, and she is determined to find it. In its starred review, Kirkus praises a sunlit weapon as a superb combination of mystery, thriller, and psychological study with an emphasis on prejudice and hatred. And now I am honored to turn things over to our speaker. The digital podium is yours, Jacqueline Winspear. Thank you very much. In fact, after that terrific introduction, all I could think of is, well, I, I'm going to just go now because everything's been done for me. <laughs> That's brilliant. Um, so what I'm going to kick off with, uh, and then we'll come back to questions and so on, is um, just uh, I'm going to read a short piece from the beginning of A Sunlit Weapon. And this piece features Joe Hardy, a, who is a member of the Air Transport Auxiliary. She's a ferry pilot. The Air Transport Auxiliary was founded um, in 1939 um, by Gerard 
I have trouble with his last name, Delanger. He was actually a baron. Um, he was a, um, a financial person, but he was also chairman. He became chairman of um, what later became BOAC. At the time, he was on the board of the then British Airways. And he was a real aviation enthusiast. And he was one of the first to realize that, of course, you know, the RAF uh, pilots, they had they had a job to do. They couldn't be ferrying um, aircraft all around the UK as well. And why were aircraft ferried? Well, they had to go to maintenance depots. They had to um, they had to be brought from the factory to an aerodrome and they were building new aerodromes just nonstop around the UK. They had to be taken to um, from, an, from one bomber station to the other, from one fighter station to another. So there was a lot of movement of aircraft. And uh, in fact, he was one of the first to say, we've got to have more women on board because there weren't enough men to do the job. And um, it's interesting the number of women that before the war became licensed pilots. Some, uh, one of them, um, if we take Mary um, Wilkins Ellis, she, uh, she learned to fly at 16 and then she couldn't wait to get into, um, into the ATA to, to do her bit. So anyway, let's join Joe Hardy. Today, there had been a spitfire on Joe's chit. It was the second time she would be ferrying a kite that she could take to 400 miles per hour with ease, if only she were allowed such leeway. But really, who was to know? That first time it took only the usual half an hour with the instruction book, and she'd been up in the air determined to put the spit through its paces before she landed, with no one around to catch her having some fun. Everyone wanted to fly the Supermarine Spitfire. That's why the American aviatrices came over and joined the ATA, even before Pearl Harbor brought thousands of GIs to British soil. Now there was an Argentinian among their number, a Czech, a few Canadians, and a Polish girl too, the latter as fearless as her country's fighter pilots who'd taken off when the Nazis invaded their country. Those Poles had flown to Britain determined to have their revenge on the Luftwaffe. Should she risk swooping under a bridge? She had the measure of the Spitfire now and felt like an old hand, so, well, why not? Last week, when Jenny was delivering a spit to Biggin Hill, she thought she'd execute a couple of barrel rolls before landing her charge, only to shock the RAF officer waiting on the tarmac, red with temper and at the ready to tear the pilot off a strip for indulging in risky airborne hijinks. There was no love lost between the RAF brass and the ATA. According to a story that had already become legend, the crusty officer was stunned into silence when he saw the aviator pull off his helmet as Jenny clambered down to the ground, revealing long blonde hair and a winning smile as she approached him, saluted and said, good morning, sir. Apparently I've got to shift a hurricane down to Hawkinge. Mind if I have a quick cuppa before I leave? Joe had ferried this route before, and though captivated by the fields and farms below, as she crossed Kent into Kent bound for Biggin Hill, she kept a keen eye around and above her. Ferry pilots had no ammunition on board, so if a lone wolf Luftwaffe pilot came out of the clouds in his Messerschmitt, she'd have to move fast. Evasive action was the only option to save her own life and a valuable aircraft. And that was her job, her remit to deliver an aircraft in one piece because God knows they couldn't lose any more airplanes or pilots. At last she saw the bridge. They all knew where it was, a railway bridge high enough and wide enough for a thrill. Ease up on the throttle, bring down the nose, level flight under the span, then open her up and climb fast on the other side. Jo felt the rush of adrenaline hammer through her body as she pulled up the Spitfire, the carburetor flooding the engine with fuel for sudden acceleration. She began to laugh. She hadn't laughed in so long. It was as if shackles were beginning to fall away from her heart. Turning the Spitfire, Jo swooped in low over the fields. That's when she heard it. A crack aft of the spit, as if something had snapped or she had hit something or... Something had blown or flown into the aircraft. She reduced speed, turned and swooped low again, just to make sure she could climb, relieved 
when she realized she wasn't losing fuel, nor was she on fire. Perhaps it was a bird or just one of those sounds that seemed to come out of nowhere to keep you on your toes, the gods of flight making sure you were paying attention. Then she saw him, a man standing by the open door of a barn in the middle of a field, his firearm pointed skyward. She pulled up again and then came low, but not too low for another look. And he was firing once more as if a mere bullet could bring her down. Though she knew as well as anyone that a bullet could bring you down if it caught an aircraft in the wrong place. Thank you very much. So I think we're back to some questions now. <laughs> oh man, I'm so, I mean, I've, I've, I'm a, I know that she survives, but I'm worried. I'm very worried for Joe after that. <laughs> um, well, you would be. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. She's um, she's quite the character, as Joe. She's very um, forthright. She is a young woman who, to be honest, is pretty much as as had everything she wanted in life. And uh, we soon find that out when she goes to see Maisie Dobbs and basically said, you know, yes, you know, I can write your check right now. You know. Let's get on with it. And, and she, she can be a little pushy at times. Um, but then maybe you had to be if that's what you were doing. One thing about the um, air transport auxiliary was that most of the women ended up having more um, hours under their belt and able to fly more planes than the, the men in the RAF. And if you think of it, here's what a, a typical day would be that they would get to the, you know, obviously they, they were at either, you know, White Waltham, which was in um, um, Berkshire, or they were down in Southampton and um, at a place called Hamble. And there were a couple of other places they were based, but they were the main bases for the women ferry pilots. Uh, women ferry pilots made up about 10 percent of the total Okay. sort of very pilot league and they and it's important to say they were not members of the RAF it was a civilian organization mm -hmm. and in fact women pilots working for the ATA were the first women ever government employees to gain pay parity with men oh they wow were, by 1943 they were paid the same as men but you know they would early in the morning they would report for their duty and they would each get a little chit and it would tell them what they were doing that day. And there would be an air taxi outside, an aircraft called an Anson. And they would, the Ansons would be lining up, ready to take these pilots to wherever they were going to either, pick, you know, to pick up an aircraft. Uh -huh. So what you might have on your, your chit for the day was Spitfire to Biggin Hill, um, travel from Biggin Hill to Hawkinge, pick up a, um, a hurricane, take it in for servicing or whatever, or maintenance. And then from there, you would have to go to a bomber station, get in a Blenheim, maybe get in. Um, and by 1943, uh, women ferry pilots were, were flying the Lancaster, which was a massive bomber. Mm. And then they'd go from there maybe to fly a short Sterling up to, you know, Presswick in Scotland or something. And uh, so they, it was a really full day. Mm. You know, you didn't just fly one aircraft and think, well, that's it. I'll go home and have a cup of tea. You know, right. you were you were boom, 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 up and down, up and down. You, um, you know, I think think you know that um if i take mary ellis for an example i think she flew something like 74 different kinds of aircraft throughout the war and she was also the first woman ever to fly um britain's uh one of the first women to fly britain's gloucester meteor which was britain's first jet aircraft and that was obviously after the war so they were they were quite wow. quite a cadre <laughs> dang were did did joe hardy kind of come about sort of as a composite of these women that you were already she, aware of or she just you know it's it's where who knows where character comes from I didn't have to sit and think about her for long okay. I just had a you know I'd been reading about the women of the ATA for years and in fact you know I one gets the idea well I have to speak for myself here I can't speak for all writers that you get the idea for a novel long before you start it mm -hmm. and um you know, you, 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 there are things you want to write about. And, and when I first started writing Maisie Dobbs as a series, you know, I, I started in a notebook and I started, noted things that I would like to write about, that I'd like to include somewhere. And, um, and then, you know, the, and you get along to the years. And of course, this came together in 1942, which was Eleanor Roosevelt's uh, visit to, to Britain. Um, but I first learned about the ATA 
more years ago than I care to mention. Okay. <laughs> it was in my first sort of real job after college. Um, I actually, okay. I, I worked for an airline and I oh, met okay. the mother of one of the girls I worked with and um, that her mother had been a member of the ATA. Oh, wow. and, and it was okay. really interesting, you know, and I, I can't remember the girl's name or anything like that, but I do remember talking to her mom. Mm. And, um, and, and in fact, I don't know if anyone's, uh, I hope you have heard of the, the writer uh, Twist Phelan, her, her mother was a ferry pilot in the Second World War. Mm. So that, that's interesting. Okay. Um, but yeah, I, was, I always was interested in this, this fact that these women were doing this job and they were flying all day. And uh, initially the women pilots were already trained pilots, but then they had to get more on board. So they would then train them. And uh, what they were looking for, they particularly, this is what really interested me. They were particularly looking for women who were export, expert horse riders, horseback ride, at horseback riding. Okay. And you know why? Because to, and I have, I, I ride, so I know I do. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't ride, so like I'm speculating, but yeah, I don't really know. You have to be really have really sensitive hands, which you have to have flying oh. a plane, especially those kinds of planes they had in those days. Oh. So yeah, it was interesting. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that is absolutely not where I was going. So that yeah. wow, that is it was a very dangerous job. It was a very yeah. dangerous job because um well for the for a start, the first um women pilots with the ATA they were given the worst jobs I mean you know let's test the girls let's see what they're made of sure and um they were given the job to fly for example training aircraft up to Scotland in the middle of the winter and, it, and, and invariably the training aircraft were open cockpit and until they actually got Sidcot suits which it, which is kind of like wearing a duvet you know um that, can you imagine they're freezing cold up there because yeah. planes didn't have heaters much oh in those God. days and um, and then, of course, they were, were given better, you know, more better jobs. And they just obviously couldn't wait to get into the Spitfire. A, all aviators wanted to fly the Spitfire because it was, um, you know, it was the fastest aircraft in the world. Mm. And uh, it was um, a, a brilliant aircraft. Uh, one little snippet before I, I be quiet and let you go on and, and that I absolutely love is that, you know, there were one of the reasons that they were flying aircraft to maintenance depots was because they, the aircraft needed to be fixed mm -hmm. and so that was a very dangerous job one oh, woman sure. was killed when the propeller just dropped off her aircraft oh, and yeah. she plunged to earth right. um it didn't have ammunition on board so if you were flying along and and some and a, a lone wolf measurement came around oh my the God. only thing that would get you out of trouble was your airmanship and and so these women had they definitely Yikes. had that in spades but in the earlier days, the Spitfire had a, a, a fault, which was considered quite devastating in that if you, or it could be, if you did uh, what was a maneuver, which took you into what they call negative G, which was basically, I suppose, straight down, mm -hmm. they, um, the carburetor completely cut out and, and you could get it started, but sometimes you were so low, you couldn't. So you ended up crashing or whatever. And most pilots knew that if you put it into a half roll before you made that maneuver, it, it avoided it. Mm -hmm. But it definitely needed to be fixed. And so uh, the, you know, uh, aircraft uh, where they were doing a lot of the research and so on, they were really working hard to find out what's the solution. And the person, the engineer who found the solution was a woman called Beatrice Schilling. Mm -hmm. And she found that it was just a little brass, a brass ring with a hole in it that you added to the carburetor and uh, would would stop that happening oh man and um it, it was interesting because it was also a fault that would give away your position to um to uh, to uh, the Luftwaffe because when you started the engine again I mean all this black smoke oh gosh so okay. you might as well right. said I'm here I'm flying come get me uh-huh so uh -huh. anyway there oh you go women, okay women, women, and <laughs> women and flight it's a big topic Oh man. I mean, flight in general, it just, it, uh, it, whenever I hear stories from pilots or just even just on the periphery, the idea, you know, and it's just, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's like cowboy stories. Or I mean, it just, it's <laughs> wild, the situations that they can, that, you know, they can end up in and then manage to get themselves out of. And to, to this end, actually, we have a question from Susie okay. Tierden who asks, um, she says, loved the book as always. Did you get to fly? in a vintage plane for research? So, you know, that's a really good question. I really wanted to do that. But unfortunately, um, when I was 
working on, you know, the, working up to writing this book, we were in lockdown and I, I wanted to go to the UK to Biggin Hill because you can fly Oh. Uh, fly in a Spitfire. You don't fly. Yourself. Oh wow! And uh, um, I would have absolutely loved to do. It. And you know what? It's still on my. It's still on my list of things to do. And and I'm I'm believe it or not not. I'm getting better. I wasn't the best passenger in a plane. Mm. I have actually been at the controls of a very large jet, and that is mm. a completely different story, which uh, we won't go into. But it's something I did when I was very young. Oh, uh, and, and but really at at the controls and. Um, and uh, but no, I didn't get to fly in a Spitfire. I would I, actually what I would really love is to fly in a Lancaster bomber because mm. I've always liked them. Isn't it weird having this thing about vintage aircraft? Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Spitfire and a Lancaster, you know, and then a, a Hurricane. Uh, that would those would be my top three. They are the three that make up what's called the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight. Mm. And if ever you watch any big event in, in, in Britain, you'll see them at this year's Platinum Jubilee. Um, celebrations for um, the Queen um, and it's the three aircraft and I tell you it, it, it makes me want to cry when mm. I see them come down low over London the three aircraft that, that, that along with other aircraft you know just you know went to war. Wow and the, those are uh, all three of those types of aircraft they're, they're at um, was it Biggin Hill is that the name of it? Uh, no Biggin Hill was mainly a fighter station Okay. Um, there okay. were there's you know the difference between a fighter state and, and there are some places where obviously you know fly anything out of there but <laughs> mainly Biggin Hill was a fighter station um, and uh, you know my mother was ev evacuated to right near there mm. and uh, so you know during the Battle of Britain um, and so you, it was happening above her head virtually you know the kids had to sit in trenches and kind of watch this <sighs> going on yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> um, we have uh, we had another question about ATA. Oh, where'd it go? Sorry, they were called um, the Atta Girls. I forgot to say oh, they the Atta called, Girls, right? Atta Girls, <laughs> you know. Then that was you know the nickname. Yeah, Atta, Atta Girl, you can do it. And right. uh, and my story and part of the story where the the young woman um, who I named Jennifer. Um, landed at uh, Biggin Hill after, and, and then was seen doing a barrel roll or whatever before she landed. That is actually a true story. That actually mm. happened. What, and, and she got off, and, you know, flicked her hair back. I took off her flying helmet, and there was a <laughs> an RAF guy just ready oh, to just blow his top. His he, he had to walk off, you know. And, oh my, that's yeah. great. I love that. I, I love knowing that happened. I, yeah. That's fantastic. Um, we actually have a, another question from someone who asked, did you interview anyone from the ATA as research for the book? No, I didn't. And, and that is because, you know, I, th th these ladies um, are, you know, m most of them gone now. Right. I was and, it would be a uh, but I've, but here's what I did. I oh, watched sure. um, documentary footage and it, particularly interviews with um, Mary, um, er, Mary Ellis. And uh, who was, uh, I think she died about three years ago. Mm. No, it would have been a bit more than that, maybe four years ago. And she was 101 when she died. Oh, wow. And, and, and she was in aviation all her life from the age of 16. She later ran uh, an airport and so a small airport. I think it was on the Isle of Wight. But, you know, she, and she was the one who, who said these words that I, I quote in the author's note at the end of the, the book. She said, um, her name is Mary Walkins Ellis. I, I think I got that around the other way. She died in 2018. And she said, men take ownership of war and talk endlessly of their duty. I can't imagine why they don't think women feel such things too. <laughs> you know, I mean, and isn't that the truth? Mm -hmm. She also, in, one, in a documentary I, I was listening to and watching, she was talking about um, having a spitfire one day, she had to deliver it, but she had a little bit of time. So she just played in the clouds and it was so lovely, but it was a reminder that it was the young that go to war. You yeah. know, I think she was only 21, 22 when she was doing this. Mm -hmm. And it's the young that go to war, not the elderly. And, right. um, and there she was playing. Mm. My mother-in-law was 22. The, the book is dedicated to my mother-in-law, who was about 22 when she shipped out in early 1942. Uh, maybe she was about a bit older, 23 or something, but she shipped out... Um, on the um on the queen mary and um 
uh, she was in, a, in the American Army Nursing Corps and she was stationed in, in oh. Britain for until 1946. Oh, so that's where okay. I got some inf years ago. I mean, she passed away about 10 years ago, but mm -hmm. you know, the experiences are what it was like being a Yankee in London. <laughs> right. Know? Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but no, I wasn't able to um, to interview anyone with the ATA. But, you know, there are books about there are memoirs and I read the memoirs. I read the books. I watched the footage. And um, and if anybody watches it, there's um, uh, Ewan McGregor and his brother, whose name I cannot remember. They they've done a couple of documentaries on aviation during world war ii oh wow uh, well it's interesting because his brother was an raf pilot uh, and oh. uh, a combat pilot in the iraq war oh, okay. and um and there's a lovely scene where he interviews um mary and also joy lofthouse who was another ata pilot and they come in for the interview on the anson air taxi which they oh, would have wow. last been in during the war hmm. and it's it's a it's a lovely little snippet of an interview and not least and I was telling some people this yesterday when uh Ewan McGregor <laughs> helps Mary out and of course she was you know she's in her 90s then yeah he helps her out of the aircraft and she's the first thing she said to us him I just have to go to the loo <laughs> which I thought was wonderful you know and, uh, um, but anyway so that those those sorts of documentaries and um other documentaries that I've watched women and war and of course that's why Eleanor Roosevelt was in Britain, was to, to see Britain's women mm -hmm. engaged in war work, all manner of war work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have, uh, I actually, I wanted to ask you sort of a similar question to this, but uh, Rosemary Sartor um, is uh, asking about, uh, writing about sort of your treatment of your thought process around um, writing about uh, racism and segregation in the American army. And it, I, I, I was, I'm curious about your research around that or kind of what, um, yeah, how, how did it, how did it feel? How were you thinking as you were kind of writing that just, I, I feel like you don't really get that a lot in war novels, uh, or, you know, that the, the, there are, there are different, it's kind of nothing to see here. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but it, it, it seems as though the novels in world war two, they kind of tend to focus on other, on other things. And I, I mean, I, I like that you, uh, bring it up in the book um and um yeah like rosemary i'm just um curious about how how yeah how you consider um, your you treatment know, of it in the book it's one of those things that you have to touch with a light hand in a way but you know i'm i'm uh, any books written on this subject were written in the 1970s so i had to go back and um you know, read some of those books. There was uh, particularly someone like Norman Longmate who wrote the book, The GIs, which really explored the, the, the you know, GIs coming to the UK. And also, you know, even in uh, Eleanor Roosevelt's uh, books about Eleanor Roosevelt that's covered. And in my newsletters, which I do, I usually do several pre-publication newsletters. It's interesting that, you know, she, I found the, 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 the photographs online that she made a point of visiting, um, you know, black American soldiers based in mm -hmm. the UK. And, um, and before I go any further, one thing I will say, uh, a, a sort of, it's just one of those things that's, I, I think, really important. Um, there was a one, um, the, the women of the, they were known as the six triple eights. It was the, uh, the only uh, battalion of um, black American women that was posted overseas mm -hmm. during the war and they were posted to the UK. Oh. Um, in this last week, they were finally awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. Oh, man. You know, okay. dollar short, but, you know. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, it took them long, um, but, uh-huh. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, and, um, but but here's the thing, it, it, it always, I was always curious about it, and uh, when I say always, for many years, mm -hmm. um, and uh, how did I research that? Obviously, I was reading and so on, and the interesting thing is that, you know, this, obviously the war was before the big influx of um, citizens from the Commonwealth, particularly the Caribbean, uh -huh. that were brought into Britain in the 1950s, right. mainly to take up jobs um, to rebuild post-war Britain. Mm -hmm. And some of them were also, in, in some cases, strike breakers, um, mm -hmm. and which is never, you know, puts people in a very difficult position. And so, of course, yeah. there was a lot of racial conflict arose at that time. And um, 
And but here's the thing. Well, there were a couple of things. Number one, at the outset of war in Britain, there were only seven or eight thousand people of color living in the United Kingdom, and they mm. obviously came from the then empire. They were from yeah. mainly from uh, certain African countries, from from the West Indies, a lot mm -hmm. from the Indian subcontinent. Yeah, and they were chiefly living in cities, not even just towns, but cities, and often near a dock area because. That's where people came into and they tended to stay in those areas. Mm -hmm. um, so most people, even in a, a market town in Britain, a sizable town, had never seen a person of color. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. sudden, and, and then, of course, you had um, even bef long before the GIs came in, you know, the war had been already going for two years. So you had troops from across the empire. And uh, so there were you know, Indian Indian troops, there were troops from the, um, the West Indies and so on. And they, again, a lot of them were mainly in cities rather than rural areas. But when the Americans came in, a lot of them were immediately in rural areas because they had to build runways, big bases and so on and so forth. And among the first to arrive were the black Americans because they were in maintenance units. They weren't in combat oh. units. So they were the ones sent over to build those runways, build those bases and so on. Oh, and here's the thing. They were seen as part of this influx of Americans. And Americans were seen in a very, um, uh, almost a romantic way because of mm. the movies. Right, you know? right. And right. Uh, it's the Americans coming. Yeah. And, um, uh, and I will add that, you know, the, the Britain just felt very protective and um, wanted to honor the troops from, you know, there was C Canada, Australia, New Zealand. Think of all the countries that there were already troops in the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. And uh, so anyway, the, the, the Americans came initially, chiefly the, the black Americans in rural areas where they'd never seen a person of color. And they were held with, for the most part, with great affection. And I know this might be um, maybe offensive to some people that are listening, but you, you can't get away from that which happened. But they were referred to uh, very affectionately as darkies, which oh, we man. might think, oh, okay. I'm going to flinch at that. Right. Um, yeah. No, that's uh, yeah. And I, I can remember when I was a kid, you would never have referred to a person of color as black. That would have been just horrible. You would have got a Right. Yeah. Got, no, my mother got, talks about I would have got a wrap across the knuckles for that right. and worse. And anyway, but they were held with great affection and it, because people knew why they were there, mm -hmm. which was to be a support, which was to be part of this big war effort, which was to help fight Hitler mm -hmm. and the, you know, the Nazis. It was, they weren't there just to, you know, they weren't there as movie stars. And <laughs> You know, I, I, I read one account of um, this woman who, when she was a little girl, I think she was about 10, and they're all standing there, you know, in the, in the village watching these jeeps come through and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the American army, you know, here come the Yanks. And, um, and some of the, the soldiers got off to walk as well. They were walking, marching along. And the, the, the Black Americans often used to dance as they walk, as they marched. It was part mm -hmm. of their thing. And one of them held her hand and walked along with her, and she was thrilled to bits she couldn't wait to tell her mom that you know one of these men had uh, had danced with her you know? and and so they were held with great affection and in fact as time went on and the british realized you know that this the segregation that that was existing within the military they were very very supportive of black americans because before, um, when America first came into the war, um, the British government was requested by the American government to institute segregation in Britain. They couldn't do that. They couldn't do that. <laughs> we had people from all over the place fighting for us. Yeah. And, and so some pretty horrible things happened. And um, because you had men coming in and women from a segregated country. Mm -hmm. suddenly realizing it doesn't have to be like that i can yeah. go to the set and line up in the same movie theater line as all the white people right and but the mps the american military police will come around trying to get them out of the line 
and and in several cases it was they were chased off by old ladies with umbrellas mm. don't you do that to our darkies oh no. oh oh, no. oh wow well. so, okay no, that's the, not yeah. i was thinking okay I was oh thinking no the military police were chased off. they're chasing off the police okay oh, no, no. <laughs> they, they, the old ladies were chasing off the, the oh, american military God. police and <laughs> you know the the white americans there were many cases they just couldn't understand why british women would would go out with a black American they go on a date with one they go out dancing they would go to the dances with the black Americans and there are some you know I include in one of my newsletters some great photographs of of black Americans you know at a dance with white British women Mm -hmm. and uh and there were you know when they they, there was uh, I was reading not long ago that um when uh many British people found out uh, was well, collectively found out that black Americans were um, the discipline that they received from the American army was uh, more stringent than, than that inflicted upon the white Americans. They, they really said, no, no, this shouldn't be happening. You're in our country now. You can't do that. And, um, and so there were a lot of restrictions in a way um, and, and there was one awful incident, and I can't remember whether, where I came across this, but I've got it in my research pile somewhere, that um, there was a, a black, uh, I think he was from the Caribbean, um, mm-hmm. and he was having tea at Lion's Corner House in, in London. It, it was like a chain at the time. You went in for a cup of tea and, a, and, and you know, your piece of cake or whatever. And a bunch of of uh, white American military police came in and dragged him out, and mm. he's you know, and it was it caused uproar because they thought it was an American. They assumed it was an American who was eating with white people, oh, which he would have been I allowed mean, to you, do. Uh, okay, it's, yeah, but but you know, all, all things being equal, I mean, there, I, I mean, one of the saddest things I read, and then I think you know, I think that's all. Yeah, it's such a delicate subject. And I didn't obviously didn't include this, but you get a sense of things. Was um, a, 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 sh- a shopkeeper? Some of the shopkeepers, obviously, you know, they, 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 it was like going through the pandemic. You know, they they couldn't get a lot of things, so right, shopkeepers right. were having it tough as well, and everybody had to be on ration. And a, um, I think what had happened is the. Uh, the white Americans had said they wouldn't go into shops in this certain village if they knew that they were serving black Americans. And this, this black American went into the shop and asked the lady shopkeeper for something. And apparently her eyes just filled with tears and she started to cry. And he said, it's all right, ma'am. I understand what's happening. I'll go somewhere else. Oh my God. Because she, 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 she knew that if she served him, no one else would come into her. No other Americans would come into her shop and she needed all the customs she could get. But all she did was just start weeping. And Mm -hmm. this said, it's all right, ma'am. I understand. I mean, that just, I mean, I I ended up crying. (laughs) Yeah. 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 It's, I mean, right. I mean, it's a, it's a, it was a, yeah, it's a baffling enough system. It was baffling enough is enough. Mm -hmm when it's in america and then the idea that oh well we, yeah. we need to transport all of this to another country anyway it's and it was you know the, I, 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 there, there were some hotels that were duty bound to, to have some kind of segregation it was very uncomfortable all around and and i'm sure that yes there was racism um but uh, you know you it, it's it's but i think most people just you know britain the British knew that they, you know, their, their country wasn't at its best. They'd had two years of war. Mm-hmm. Even villages were bombed, you know, not just the cities. And, it, and this, the bombing went on throughout the war, not just the, the Blitz. You know, that was just a very specific type of bombing. Mm. And so, you know, even in the, uh, the little handbook that was given to American soldiers before they came to Britain, one of the pieces in it was that you know, you're going into a country that is not its best. The people know they're not at its best. Mm. Be kind to them, mm. you know, be kind to them. And I think most people, um, and this came out in one of the, the, the uh, books that I read, um, most people felt that there, there was a great deal of understanding from the Black Americans because they often came from very deprived areas. Mm-hmm. 
and uh, they understood more about the culture. They seem to understand more about the culture in the U in the UK. For example, the fact that less than less than half the people in the UK had indoor uh, bathrooms. Well, they didn't have bathrooms, but they're indoor. They're, they, you had to go outside for the WC, you know, mm -hmm. into the garden or whatever. And uh, so that was um, under had more great a uh, greater understanding. And of course, as Eisenhower noted very quickly. Britain might not have segregation along racial lines, but it is a country segregated by class. Yeah, yeah. And that's yeah. the other thing. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, we have someone who asks, uh, sort of turning back to the, the uh, history of women in flight and asking if yeah. you have any recommendations of books on the topic. Um, actually, there's a really one really good book. Oh, gosh, it's it's in the pile over there. <laughs> so I can't remember the author. It's called Spitfire Girls. Mm. And it was published okay. about three or four years ago, three, four, five years ago, Spitfire Girls. And it's a nice, it's a nice little book to read. It really is. Um, and then from there, you can find memoirs and so on. And, uh, you know, there's obviously nice, nice footage that you can find online, just noodle around a bit. But I like Spitfire Girls. Mm. Okay. Okay. Oh, actually, I, well, one, uh, I do want to ask this quick question, and then while I while I pick out some audience questions to ask, but what was it like um, rendering Eleanor Roosevelt in a novel? <laughs> it was it like? again light hand, but yeah. you know it was surprisingly easy. And here's why it was easy: in that um, she, when she came over to, she was invited to the United Kingdom by Queen Elizabeth, and I don't obviously don't mean our present queen because she was only Princess Elizabeth at the time, but mm -hmm. the, her mother, Queen Elizabeth, who later became Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother. And um, she invited Eleanor Roosevelt specifically to, um, to observe Britain's women actively in war work. And she spent a lot of time doing that. And she had to travel to the UK by a very circuitous, well, not a circuitous route. It was the best route to take. You know, she flew into Shannon. Um, hmm. and, uh, and then she flew on from, from Shannon in Ireland uh, to Southampton in, um, in, 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 in the south coast uh, of England. And she was restricted to the same amount of baggage as everyone else. And she had to travel under an assumed name. Now, the woman was coming for about a month. But oh, there wow. she is, and, and you can imagine all the events that she had to do, all the walking she had to do, and she had one pair of shoes, I think, for daytime, and she might have had an evening pair of shoes. She got off the plane in Shannon, and she's traveling under an assumed name with her secretary, uh, Miss Thompson, and um, people knew who she was straight away. She's six yeah. feet tall. Right. And if you look <laughs> at the, the footage... Um, she's wearing the same coat and hat in every single event mm -hmm. because she only had one coat. She had and one hat. bag. Yeah. She actually wore her shoes out. She wore the soles I mean, of her shoes and had to stuff newspaper in her shoes. Mm -hmm. And eventually they got her another pair of shoes. Um, and when she landed, she had to, she was given a ration card. Um, she landed, she eventually she went from Shannon, she was held up in Shannon because of weather, eventually landed in um, Southampton. She was met on the train at Paddington by the King and Queen, because in those days, royalty would never meet any dignitary off a plane. It was always off the train. So she had, I, I can't, I don't know whether she had the Royal train or not, but she came hmm. up to Paddington station. And almost immediately, you know, she was uh, visiting the East End of London. Mm -hmm. And she was stunned because the people of the East End who had be lost so much, thousands killed in bombings their homes laid waste to waste they were standing in the rubble waving to her mm -hmm. and giving her a greeting and she couldn't believe that people who had lost and she wrote about it in her my day column that people who had lost so much came out to greet her mm -hmm. and that was pretty much how she was greeted everywhere always wearing the same hat and the same coat and the same mm -hmm. shoes so how did I get a sense of, of Eleanor Roosevelt? Um, and it was, she's seen more than she's heard in the book, although there was one mm -hmm. meeting with, with Maisie, which is a very brief meeting. And it's, you know, I read about four books on her and also her My Day columns mm -hmm. to get a right. sense of, of, of her, how, her, her, you know, her bearing, for example, and what 
people watching her would have seen mm-hmm. and what and how they might have been impressed and of course she was um it, it was a, a massive security risk because you know the 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 uh the nazis would have loved her as a hit and there were definitely german agents circling she had to travel the way she couldn't travel by boat because of u-boats and even a plane mm. was risky which is why she traveled under an assumed name and um heavy security and in fact uh, she vis- one of her visits while in the county of Kent, which is, of course is chiefly where the book is set, uh, was to Canterbury Cathedral and mm. then later to the village of Barham, which is not far from Canterbury, and uh, to meet women of the Women's Institute there and so on. She, uh, Canterbury was bombed the very next day. I think something oh. like 20 bombs were dropped. And had they not got the day wrong, which they did, they were after Eleanor Roosevelt. Oh. She would probably have been killed. And uh, because they were, they were, uh, they just, they just bombed the whole place, and uh, and 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 the village. Yeah. Try, but they got their day wrong, you know. Mm-hmm. They were another lot a day, day late and a dollar short. Oh my god! <laughs> we have, thank goodness. Right. I mean, it's just uh, yeah. The the the. I was going to say the whirly gig of time. That's not the phrase I want. But right. Yeah. Just the. the I know. I know <laughs> the accidents. Um, we have a couple of people asking um, if you wouldn't mind speaking about this a little bit before we wrap up, maybe just uh, a couple of questions. One is kind of where did Maisie come from? What was your inspiration for her? And and we also have several people who are um, very happy about Sunlit Weapon and also very eager to know when the next Maisie Dobbs book is coming out or whether there's another one in the works. Okay. Um, so where did Maisie come from? You know, Maisie came to me unbidden. Uh, I, I think a lot of people know this story. I was actually stuck in traffic on a very rainy day in California while on my way to work. Mm. And um, it was really, <laughs> I, I literally stuck there. And uh, I'm a bit of a daydreamer. So, you know, off I go. And it usually starts with, did I, did I lock the door? Did I <laughs> leave the dog? the door open for the dog so she could get out into the garden da, 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 da. and um anyway and then in my mind's eye this woman walked into my life and and literally if you read the first uh, first two three scenes of of the first book in the series that's what i saw in my mind's eye and and actually what happened was <laughs> suddenly i could hear all this honking and oh, no. I, I even heard someone yelling out any particular shade of green you're waiting for, lady? Oh, God. <laughs> because all the traffic had moved on and I was holding up all the traffic behind me, which <laughs> I don't because I'm just sitting there in my little world. But by the time I got to work, which was about a 45, 50 minute journey, I had this whole story in my head and I couldn't wait to get mm. home to start writing. The first chapter, for example, has never changed to this day. Oh, wow. And, but, I've always referred to that as my moment of artistic grace, but I don't think those moments happen in a vacuum. I have always been interested since I was a kid in the history of women. And in fact, I recently wrote about it on my Facebook page and and showed this book I made at school at the age of eight, which was called Mm -hmm. Famous Women. One of those women um, was Amy Johnson, the famous aviatrix. Mm. And so, you know, it was there even then. It's all there. (laughs) But... um, but I was, I've always been particularly interested in the women who uh, came of age in the, in the Great War. Mm-hmm. They're, they're an extraordinary generation of women. They were the first generation of women who went to war in modern times in, 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 in great numbers in, in the UK. It didn't quite happen in that way in the United States because the United States wasn't in the war for that long, you know, yeah. for that long period of time. But still there were there were women here in fact the first women nurse the first nurses to arrive on the western front in the first world war were from the massachusetts general hospital oh wow um, they were volunteers a volunteer medical team but it was that generation because when i was a kid i knew that generation i knew yeah. who they were and yet you know for for so many of them there would never be a husband and children because so many men of marriageable age had been killed mm-hmm. and they you know, turned out to be this this amazing generation that I had read about and was interested in for years since I was easily in my teens. 
So is it surprising that Maisie Dobbs came into my life? I knew her name straight away. Mm -hmm. um, I knew who she was. And by the time the book went into production, when I was being asked, you know, about a series, that's when I was able to, because I didn't think I had a series. I just thought I had one book. I thought, well, that's it. You know, that's my yeah. one novel. <laughs> and, uh, and there we go. Um, so that's where Maisie came from, fully formed. And what about the next Maisie Dobbs? Well, I have to tell you, I'm not writing a Maisie Dobbs book at the moment. I am currently writing another standalone novel uh, with another, ex no, I think, extraordinary woman character from roughly the same era. And it's, uh, suffice it to say, it's about the intersection between, it's set in 1947, mm -hmm. and the place where organized crime the intelligence services and the higher levels of government operate. Oh, wow. And not, and not always in the best interests of the country. And so, and that is based again on my research, but um, okay. it's something that I wanted to do. A, a book I wanted, a, a book I've wanted to write for, for many years and I'm writing it. Cool. So there won't be a Maisie Dobbs for a, a, a while yet, I'm afraid. All right. But there will be a it 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 goes all the way to the top. Watch watch this space thriller novel. <laughs> yeah. The next one is more thriller than anything else. But it's again it's it's um you know one of these extraordinary women, mm -hmm. and uh, a, a woman who you know lives through two wars, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's all I'm going to say about that. All at right. This stage. <laughs> yeah. But I always like I always want I always wanted to write about organized crime in post war London, post World mm -hmm. War Two London. It was uh, because crime was rife, you know. War brings home soldiers with weapons who then have to do something with them. Yep. Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> um, well, thank you. That that sounds like a fantastic project. Thank you so much for for chatting with me. <laughs> oh, it's great. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure thank you. to thanks. see you. Yeah, you too. And and thanks to everybody who's who's been sort of uh, following the, this this uh, this conversation. Um, Sorry, I can't answer more questions. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'd like to thank you all again for, uh, or thank you as well for joining us. I have posted a link in the chat to purchase copies of A Sunlit Weapon. And on behalf of all of us at Harvard Bookstore, uh, stay well, happy reading, and have a good night. And you too, Jackie, thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, you too. Thank you very much indeed. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>